Hi, my name is Kyle Hogarth. I work at the University of Chicago. I run a center for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And this video is short but sweet. Uh, I'm going to basically present how I talk about the genetics of alpha-1 to patients and families. Obviously, people watching this video understand basic genetics uh, through all their medical training and college training and even high school. Um, and that's actually one of the ways I help to remind patients that they've already heard some of this before in basic high school biology. And thankfully, alpha-1 genetics is as simple as that. So uh, thanks for spending some time with me. I promise to be short and sweet and, and give some verbiage, if you will, that I've found very effective uh, to talk about alpha-1 genetics uh, with my patients. So let's talk about the genetics of alpha-1 and to keep it obviously simple, right? This is not about talking to another healthcare provider. This is about a patient who's obviously worried and scared, has been told they have a genetic disorder, and understandably also is worried about the possibility of passing it on to their children and whether their extended family is affected, et cetera. So these slides obviously are going to be simplified, but the idea behind it is to give us, you and me, the, the, the straightforward language that helps uh, a patient who doesn't have a healthcare background or even a biology background to understand the genetic aspect of their disorder. And this is obviously not a clinical talk that's separate, obviously, to talk about alpha-1. And it, I promise it to be short and sweet. So thank you for your time. So the basic thing I explained to patients, said, look, I got two copies of every gene, one from mom and one from dad. And so if you're a double Z, you know for a fact that obviously you got one gene from each parent. The carriers, I said, you know, we don't know. We can test the parents if we're interested to find out where they might have gotten it from, if that's possible. They've, they've not, unfortunately, passed away. But it's it's immaterial where they got it from, in other words, which parent, other than sometimes I think people are just generally interested. Um, obviously, I remind them that each sperm or egg only contains one gene. And I remind them that they've heard this before. This was high school biology. But it's to refresh the brain, and it's to help them understand and predict. Um, so it's always worth going through that again. I remind everybody the normal allele is called M, and we're usually talking about Z and S, though there are multiple other mutations present, uh, up to 240 and, and growing, um, and they're obviously less common. Um, the, F, um, the F gene and the I gene are also relatively more common, but, but this is ultimately what we're talking about. And again, with basic genetics, it's the two abnormalities, and we go from there. So if someone's an MM person, I explained to them, all you're making is M eggs. And so this is relevant from the perspective when I have the patient in front of me and I tell them, you're a double Z, have we tested your significant other? The, you know, your spouse, your significant other, the person you're going to reproduce with or already have reproduced with. Because if they're MM, that's important. They can only make M eggs. When I have my MZ person, I tell them, you're going to make one of each kind of sperm and it's going to be random. It's going to be variable. You got an M or a Z. That's it. And then obviously my ZZ person, and obviously egg and sperm, you can switch them back and forth here, but all you make is this. So I explain to every one of my double Zs, and, and this comes around as part of my discussions, is say, look, if you're double Z and your significant other is double M, I don't even have to test your children. They're going to be carriers. This is the only possibility. And I think it's very reassuring because understandably there are some concerns about, you know, having a genetic test and there's nothing wrong with me. And understandably there's a, uh, I think, a, a level of fear and concern about having genetic information on a, on a relatively healthy person. So I draw this all the time in my practice. And it's funny because as soon as I start drawing out a Punnett square, um, patients almost reflexively go, oh, I remember that, right? You know, Gregor Mendel and his peas. But it's very helpful for me to explain this to him, especially your MZs, where I explain, look, you either make an M or a Z sperm, and let's say they're male, and your significant other, if that's say they're an MZ, and, and this is where I always point out, of course, as we know, the carrier rate in the United States is quite high, up to about 5% of the population. So there's statistically a probability that you are indeed going to be reproducing with a carrier. And then I basically show this to them so that they understand the value of testing across their entire extended family because carriers are going to marry into that family tree somewhere. And, of course, there's a 25% chance that they're going to have a child with absolutely nothing, a 50% chance that they're going to have a child exactly like them, carrier. But obviously what we're interested in is the 25% chance that they're going to have a child that we're going to need to obviously monitor differently. I remind them, of course, that alpha-1 is not a genetic lethal disorder. It's not, you know, something that they shouldn't be reproducing or having any concerns about that. It's something, though, that you want to be aware of, that if you have a child who's a double C, so that, you know, you can arrange, uh, arrange for them to be raised in a, you know, less pollution, no smoke, you know, et cetera, um, and what to monitor for. 
Now, and I show the other example all the time too, and why I explain I don't need to test your children if you I've got a double Z in front of me and their and their spouse has been tested and the spouse is double M. Every one of their children is going to be an MZ. This is the only genetic possibility, obviously outside of someone else being uh, if, the, if the double Z is a male, someone else being the father. So, and then when you know, I always uh, will occasionally draw this because you can get the complete randomness. If you have an FZ in front of you who's having children with an SI, you got the whole package in front of you of variability, and that's sort of the basic beauty of the genetics of alpha one. And so I don't always have to draw this example. I usually obviously tailor it to what's in front of me. A lot of this is in front of me and a lot of this is in front of me. Um, obviously you can substitute Z for S or whatever, you know, letter combinations your patients have, but the, the, the blank piece of paper and you drawing the squares and drawing the possibilities really helps people better understand it, especially when we're drawing out a family tree and outlining, uh, you know, who's been marrying into this family tree, uh, and so forth. So, Here's a great, you know, another way to draw it, right? If you like to draw the the sort of classic round circle female, square male, MZs, and then the chances again, this is a different way to represent it. I personally, I found the Punnett square to be more, um, it, it, it rings home, it rings more true for, for patients. And then I'm going to show you a, a, a real example. Um, and this is, you know, why it matters and what I always highlight to people about like you being an MZ, for example. So this gentleman right here is an MZ. And you say, okay, well, you know, and he's healthy. So, you know, is there any relevance to him? You know, he got tested by accident or maybe he had a consumer genetic test or maybe he's got real mild COPD, whatever, whatever. Yeah, because if he's an MZ, where did he get that from? Well, it turns out he had a double Z father and an MM mother. That's why his brother's a carrier, right? There's, there it is, writ large. But when you find some of these MZs, what you unearth is the potential for not only double Zs, but also look what else is happening in this family tree. They're... A lot of double Zs because a double Z had children with an MZ, but here another double Z having children with an MZ led to three children that were double Z. And so, you know, the, the value of the genetic side of this is to be able to, you know, when I talk to my patients about uh, their extended family, and, and obviously you can get uh, family testing easily through the Alpha Foundation, through the Alpha One Coded Testing Program, um, or their physician can obviously order it, or in, if, if the, one of these patients is yours as well, you can order it. But I draw out, again, why this matters, that your discovery of even being a carrier may have some significant relevance for some cousin of yours who is sitting there developing worsening lung disease, and they're just calling it standard COPD and giving them some inhalers. So obviously, as you accumulate letters, your levels are dropping and your risk for disease goes up. And as we all know, being a double Z is not an automatic lung disease, but it is definitely a higher risk. And so I always remind people that it's a, a spectrum of risk and that that knowledge can help you, obviously, to live a better life. And then in certain scenarios, obviously, implement therapeutics. And I think the carriers, the other value to this um, and when I talk about the genetics of it, uh, especially when I'm, you know, thinking about children or, you know, the extended family, is as we know, and, you know, what I was taught in high school biology, same as you, is that, you know, carriers for most diseases, it doesn't matter. But with alpha, it does matter if you're a smoker. You look at the rate of or the, their FEV1 uh, reduction in MZs who smoke versus MMs who smoked versus, of course, MZs who never smoked. And there's the key. And so I also use this information to personalize healthcare to help people quit smoking, but also to spend the mess spread the message through extended family to talk about obviously not smoking or to work in a non-polluted environment, or if they have COPD, to be um, very good about taking care of themselves in regards to medicine adherence, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm going to end there, short but sweet as promised. Uh, I work at the University of Chicago. Uh, that's our main campus right there, just south of the city. Um, and there's my email if there's uh, things that people who are watching this would like to follow up on or had questions for if I can help. Otherwise, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.